Hello and welcome to John Loughton's YouTube channel. This is gonna seem a bit weird that I am introducing John's channel for you, but there's reason behind it. My name is Sean, I'm a YouTuber from Edinburgh in Scotland, same place as John. And I've been telling John for months now that he needs to do some kind of vloggy type content, something I know quite a lot about. So I thought it'd be a good place to start today to kind of do like a Q&A interview with you, talking all about you and your history and past and stuff. Um, it's kind of weird, like John and I are both from Edinburgh, we both grew up here. We never knew each other, but we met in unusual circumstances last year, right? We did. What was that all about? I knew you were going to make me talk about it. I guess <laughs> that's the point of an interview. Yeah, exactly. So Sean and I met. People think we've been friends since like we were kids. It feels that way though. People always say, did you guys go to school together? Um, we just look old at the same time, that's all. Uh, we met actually via the US consulate, the US embassy, that's how we met. So we were both selected as kind of influential or kind of uh, busy, engaged young yeah. professionals. So in short, there was what, 12 of us, 10 of us? Yeah. US embassy have a duty to spread the values and the value of the United States here in the UK and here in Scotland. So I had already worked with the US consulate in Edinburgh, which serves Scotland, and by proxy then the US Embassy UK wide. Um, and they put us on a program around Baltimore, uh, Washington DC, mm -hmm. Florida, Texas, to go and visit the extremities of the states, if you like. So it's yeah. the issues that we don't understand in the, U the UK. Gun culture was a big Guns, one. Guns, right? racism, love of God, president, and nation kind of thing, but that the stuff that's not really um, big cultural issues here. I think there's a lot more ardent homophobia there, right? Okay. Grand homophobia. Yeah. You know, if you're talking about the Southern Belt and kind of deep Texas, and because um, quite often one of the big pushbacks to sexuality, liberalism, like equality, um, is religion, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of kind of that very strong evangelical Christianity thing that. God hates fags, church, yeah. stuff like that. That's um, crazy when you see that type of stuff. We have here, there. but not in the same yeah. not in the same way. They're very vocal there, right? Yeah. And it gets a lot of um, coverage. I don't mm. think it gets the same oxygen here. Yeah. So it was interesting, but there's a lot of crossover. So one thing's worked out is guns. Mm. Um, and we were very lucky to be in Orlando um, during the one year anniversary of the Pulse nightclub shooting, mm. talking about attacks on gay people. Um, it was Latin night, um, it was gay club and of course the kind of deranged gunmen went in and opened fire and mass <clears throat> killed and shot and targeted um, gay people who thought they were in a gay safe yeah. space. My age, my gender, my sexuality, went to the kind of clubs that I would occasionally go to. Um, I mean, it was shocking just to see from afar, but when we were actually there at the place, like you get a real picture of what happened in, in the communities that were involved, the people who were there. And we went in on quite a dark, gloomy night. We'd been busy all day, we were at NASA or something. We had a crazy day. Yeah. And we stopped on the way back at the club itself, at the, the Pulse site, and it's now a shrine, it's a memorial. It is a zone of respect, it is a live people museum of memory to those who lost their lives that night. And one of the most crazy things, I've done a lot of speeches and talks and moments, but one of the, I suppose, it's not a career, but my life highlights was the day after was the big anniversary public meeting with the police chief mm. and the town mayor and the head of the hospital and the responders and there was a victim who was in who was in there at the time who of course unluckily survived um, and they opened the floor to take questions and they called out my name that's right and I'd been all the way from Scotland <clears throat> and I was the first person to ask a question at this big public memorial event and then one of the things I said was um, it was a bit cheesy but I meant it so so much I remember saying um, an attack on an LGBT safe space anywhere is an attack on an LGBT space everywhere. Yeah. And I remember feeling that quite personally. I've never really made my private life or my, my sexuality part of my job, yeah. if you like, or what I talk about. And that brought that home, and Definitely. I've spoken about it ever since. And I think the fact that like that was a community of people who had been severely affected, like firsthand, they'd all lost friends and family in that event, and they were silent, and they were de really listening to you, and like, wow, these people have come a far way <laughs> to, to learn about what's happened here. <clears throat> and we organised a big concert and I attended a big concert and vigil and memorial in Edinburgh um, in St Andrew's Square. The First Minister came and spoke. You had the leaders of the opposition coming to speak and 
we're very blessed in this country that we have, oh, I've got to get this wrong, but a number of even the political party leaders in Parliament yeah. are non-straight, yeah. or bisexual or LGBT in some form. Um, and, and there's a, a casing, there's an absolute political culture of equality yeah. um, and representation um, in terms of yeah. in terms of that stuff. And to go over there and show that we cared about that blew lots of them away. Yeah. Um, and it's really important to show solidarity because there's never been a movement where international solidarity hasn't mattered. Yeah. Whether it was them, Nelson Mandela had been in prison, yeah, exactly. or whether it was whatever, you know, these things have been really important. Yeah. Well, I think for me on that trip, like there were so many important moments and deep conversations, but John and I had a lot of particularly deep conversations about a range of different topics. Like whether it was on the plane between cities or the plane on the way home, like we just talked a lot about a lot plane of stuff. Plane on the way home was deep. That was deep. Like deep. the thing is, we were we, high, but we were, but we were high. Yeah, we learned a lot that we were actually quite similar in a lot of ways, come from a similar background. And um, that's when I realized, like, I knew John did a lot of stuff on social media already. So to give you guys a bit of background about why I suggested you do this, is like, I looked for your social media at the time and I thought, sure. no, I thought, no, that's not, <laughs> not true. Like I thought there was a lot of good stuff, but there's like a lot of story missing. So I thought that this would be a good series to kind of like get into the real depths of like where you've come from and what you've done because your story is so interesting. I was gripped by some of the things you told me and I thought like there's a lot of people who would be, have value in what you've got to say and would resonate with it and be inspired around the world. So that is basically why I, I've encouraged you to try and, and do this series. Um, Together we are Oprah. Exactly. I talked a little bit before that I had seen you somewhere before on television. Uh, way back when, but I didn't know at the time until I actually started speaking to you that this is where I knew you from. But you were actually on Big Brother, right? Mm hmm. Um, how would you feel about talking about that? Like, fine, it's like, amazing. Who doesn't want to talk about being on Big Brother? Like, well, usually me, but I'm happy to talk about it. What was the story behind it? So, basically, I did Big Brother, it was Celebrity Big Brother, I'd done. So, it was called <clears> Celebrity <throat> Big Brother, and then the theme was Hijack. So, every year they do like a different theme, so it'll be boys versus girls, good versus yeah. evil, rich and poor, blah, 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 blah. Um, and um, I don't know if you remember, but in 2007, there was the big Shilpa, Shetty, Jade, Goody yeah. race row. I remember that. It's a Shilpa Poppadom, it's obviously ridiculous towards it. You know, Indian and Asian people, and da da da. So they were feeling like, oh my god, celebrities <clears throat> left alone are a bit kind of maybe untrustworthy or unhinged yeah. at the time. So they wanted to go for a different stroke kind of spin on it. So they wanted to put in what, like, not my term, right? Yeah. Channel 4's term, or Endemol's term, the 12 most influential and inspirational young people in the UK. Okay. And at the house. They were all busy, so they phoned <laughs> me, right? <laughs> um, and so they were wanting talented young people who so were selling. Aside from celebrities, or as well as. So or this was, at the second, this was the housemates. Okay. So they were putting these in. So it was kind of young mavericks, kind of teen yeah. geniuses, blah, blah, blah. So at that point, I was the youngest ever chair of the youth parliament. Yeah. I had been doing a lot of campaigning and quite high profile engagement in Scotland around young people and anti-poverty work and led marches on making poverty history and the anti-Iraq movement. I'd done stuff around youth work programs, around community mental health services, a whole range of things. And it led to me being the chairman of the youth parliament, mm. which for those of you that maybe don't know, the youth parliament or SYP, it's the national body that represents young people. People are elected, gets money from government, it campaigns alongside lots of organisations and it makes mm. a huge difference to young people's voices and I was the chairman of this board of trustees. So I'm kind of 17, 18, got elected chair, so I'm the chairman of the, the board, then I'm overseeing like qu over a quarter yeah. of a million pounds budget, I'm managing all these staff and it's like crazy, learning this huge curve. And then like in amongst the serious stuff, although I had a lot of fun, I got a phone call from a TV channel. Yeah. Oh hello, we've come across this guy John online and through his work and his campaigning in parliament, da da da. Would you be interested in a TV show? <laughs> a TV show. So we dig a bit deeper and they're not really giving much away. They're keeping it quite secretive. So they were scouting the country yeah. as a reverse. Usually you apply and, oh, I want to be famous. Yeah. I want to be a model and kind of, I'm parodying the people who go on the summer version. I'm not going to mock them too much, but that wasn't my gig. I was pretty yeah. awkward, insecure, wasn't really, still, I'm not necessarily the most like camerogenic or um, <laughs> like the most like clear or straightforward. But, so we said no and we left it. And then we thought about it a bit more, I thought, turns out it was Big Brother. And, this, and I, we were thinking, I'm trying to like, get profile as much as I can to talk about dispelling the myths of young people not caring about politics. Dispelling the myths of us being apathetic and lazy scroungers, yeah. hoodie wearing gang members, like I used to be a few years before that. <laughs> 
but we're actually positive contributors, yeah. we're part of the solution, we're not feral youth. And also to show young people that politics isn't the old stuffy, boring, pot hair, yeah. pot bellied, bald, kind of grey haired, white straight men who sit in Westminster, that you can just be a passionate individual who wants to change the world. And so I thought, why am I not going to the one of the most popular platforms in yeah. the whole country? I mean, that's quite funny because, like, as you say at the time, that those types of television programme were the place to be to get your name out, and everybody saw it. Like, I remember watching you at the time. Millions and millions of people watched it. Absolutely. And so I wanted to go from, like, wait for it, Parliament House to the Big Brother House. Nice. I like <laughs> that. Millions of young people never vote in elections, after elections, after elections, and it changes their life. It changes your life, your education, your transport, the cost of your music. Um, like if you don't do politics, there's not much you do yeah. do, yet mm. they don't vote. But on Big Brother, people pay like three pounds to vote. <laughs> That's crazy. I on TV. So, it's funny, I'm people getting people voting for me and they're paying for it yeah. on some reality TV show, yet we don't vote on the things that can change and transform each other's lives. For free. But it's the power of... TV understands how to connect with young people. Yeah. It understands, the, it cares about the audience. Yeah. Politics, yeah. with respect, doesn't. And I would say today's version of that, like that was how many years, 10 years ago? Decade ago. Decade ago. Over a decade ago. I would say today's version of that is social media. I was quite, I was not bigger, I'm still big, but. I remember watching it at the time thinking, how come there's a guy from Edinburgh on it? I don't know who he is. But at the same time, I was rooting for you because you were from Edinburgh, like, and you were a good guy. That's, Thanks. I think probably so a lot nothing of people, personal, just genetic, I'll oh, support the guy from No, 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 but I think a lot of people in Scotland are like, this is a really good guy and he's from Scotland and you represented a lot of young people at the time. So, it so was I went great. on as the politician, right? And they flew me to London for the interview thing and they said, um, <clears throat> I remember this. So the way it works is Endemol's very, they do everything on phone calls, so there's no evidence. You sign a non-disclosure agreement, agreement, you're not going to tell anyone you're doing it. And because it's a celebrity version, it happens January, right mm. after New Year. So it was like the 3rd of January or something like that, like you I flew down and mm. you're in hiding for a couple of days. They call it in um, quarantine. Wow. And you get a minder, you're given a chaperone um, who takes your phone off you and monitors you. <laughs> right, there was no Twitter and stuff at that point. Like it was very fresh. It wasn't really, yeah. like, I think YouTube was only launched a couple of, yeah. 2005. I yeah, would have been just out. a bit before, yeah. And they said, follow the man with the purple umbrella at Marble Arch. True story. Follow right? me down and say to him, purple haze. What? Purple haze. And then I have to follow him, and then I followed us into the Marriott Hotel. I That's mean, mad. Uh, undisclosable hotel. Um, and then I went underground to the basement, to like, the conference suites. And then like, I walked into, like, I can only describe this like a circus waiting room. Because it was just like all these great and good of different people, like, who are like young, talented people. Yeah. So I remember this there was like a contortionist, there was like um, identical um, twins, there was an Elvis Presley tribute act. Um, there was something like a leotard who'd done something bendy, probably. <laughs> there was all these different people, like a Mensa member, boxers, racing drivers, all these amazing people. And then, like, me. I was like 24 <laughs> stone ginger guy from Scotland who's like just passionate about changing the world. Like, they had the image, image of me as some politician, but I wasn't like yeah. serious in a suit kind of guy. I was kind of be a bit stupid and just like. Have a laugh. Be passionate, eh? Yeah. And long story short, the, the light men put me in it. Yeah. Big brother, right? I actually don't really talk about it, but looking back, it was amazing. It probably changed my life in so many ways. Because I had massive issues. Do you want the deep answer or the fun answer first? Deep first. Deep bit, right? I'll get it out of the way. I was like super insecure and unexposed. Mm. I was passionate to change the world, but actually I wasn't that confident internally. It was like, do you ever get that fake confidence? Who mm. am I to think I can succeed? Yeah. That was probably my strongest narrative. Okay. But Big Brother, in short, is like the country's biggest popularity contest. Yeah. It's not like a talent show where you're actually there for a talent. Yeah. You're just kind of, people like you or not. How do you get on in this social experiment? And it helped me realise that I probably can get on with mm. other people. That I can deal with like English people and I can deal with like wealthy people and I can deal with like people with different political views and I can deal with being in that like confined mm -hmm. space. But three things I like to be in control of. I like to be in control of myself and what I choose to do. The people I spend time with mm -hmm. and I get bored easy so I need to go and do stuff. Okay. Three things are taken off you in Big Brother. Yeah, that's right. Um, so it's like a, out of your comfort zone. Completely. Entirely. I had no control over what, who and where I was yeah. at any point. And then it was quite weird because like you're a guy from Scotland, a guy from Edinburgh and you're mixing with like Chris Moyles of the world and stuff like that. He was in Russell Brand. Russell Chris Brand. Moyles. Gordon Ramsay taught me taught me to cook steak live on TV. That's nuts. Um, and then Malcolm you had, um, McLaren, the manager of Sex Pistols, yeah. who passed away. Joan Rivers yeah. shouted at me. Um, Janet Street Porter said, I'm a very smart, she went, he's a smart guy. He's a very smart, very smart guy. 
So thank you, Janet. No doubt you're going to watch this. <laughs> <laughs> and then Kelly Osborne as well. Kelly I got, Osborne. I got drunk with Chris Moyles. Kelly Osborne. I had a crush on her mum. I remember telling her, Kelly, I quite fancy your mum. I mean, everybody did that those I think days. It was my stepping stone to coming out. <laughs> <laughs> Sharon Osborne. So, um, <laughs> so then. You but won, I fell right? out with Russell Brand. You fell out with Russell Brand. Aye. What about? So. He faked this can like it, can invasion. Can this be found anywhere? Eh? Can this be found anywhere? I think we'll try to take it away as much as we can. You could probably find Big Brother Celebrity Hijack, right. Russell Brand. But he, he set up this thing where like he faked like a cameraman coming in from backstage. Okay. Like breaking through that secret wall of like staff. Russell Brand hijacks the house, so every day a different celebrity kind of takes over. Yeah. And he faked this thing where like um, a hard-working, overrun, underpaid cameraman breaks out one of the emergency exits and enters the Big Brother house. Mm. Now listen. See when you're confined for weeks and weeks with no outside interference and then a cameraman, you hear the shouting and then breaks through. You remember immediately you're not in a house, you're on a film set and it's like really awkward and everyone's yeah. like freaking out. The girls like, one of the, two of the girls screamed. Oh, and some of the guys. Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and he's like, I'm sorry guys, like, hmm. the working conditions are awful. Yeah. There's rats, there's runways, we're not getting breaks that were promised. This is English. I'm um, sorry, I'm sorry to do this, but someone needs to speak <laughs> out. And then the room, and then it comes over. This is Big Brother. Everyone, housemates, to the bedroom immediately, immediately. And I'm like, Oh no, this is terrible. Come on, pal, we'll look after you. Not having it, not having it. Then I'm like trying to be the trade unionist because obviously they know I have this kind of like man yeah. of the people kind of sentiment. And totally like, it was kind of a a, a red flag. Yeah. To the bull. That's a wee choice joke. But anyway, um, and we eventually get in, and I'm furious and angry, and like didn't take it particularly well. And then Russell Brand's like, what's wrong with you? And I'm like, you, I felt a bit annoyed. And you it's just funny. It. Did you have it out? Or did you? A wee bit had it out. And then like all the other housemates were like, why are you being so angry, John? Like, You're a mole, what's a stitch up, da da da. Well. Don't get it. Anyway, such, had to be there. It was a life changing experience, I guess, in some and, ways. Oh, hugely changed my and life. And you won, my eyes, it opened my eyes. I'd work, I'd on my first campaign, right, to change against racist behaviors when I was 11. And I'd worked every day since like trying the hardest mm. to change society, I never made a penny. I was poor. Yeah. I was absolutely poor as a dodo because dodos were poor, um, and got nothing. Yeah. And then I went on reality TV, and overnight, like, <clears throat> I got money, I got coverage, I got exposure, I became like influential mm -hmm. properly, I suppose. And like, what was it like the day you stepped out of the house? Like, what was your first couple of months outside the house? Yeah, it was weird because see, the first night I went in, Matt Lucas from Little Britain was an earpiece in my ear and I could what? only say and do what he told me. So <laughs> I was first in and last out. If you're gonna do it, may as well win. <laughs> um, and I could only say whatever he told me. So like, it was cringeworthy, like mm. all, millions of people watching me and I had to pretend to have cramp, I had to get a boxer to hug me, I, I had to score around screaming cake, I had to tell a classical musician that I wrote I the original <laughs> Sound of Music. Um, Did anybody believe you? Like some people just thought it was I was a crazy Scottish guy, like a big ginger teddy bear, and like it's a bit like wacky and a bit of a character. Did they know that you were? A, did they think you were a celebrity? No. They, so nobody knew who anybody was. Each other were. Ah, but so yeah. I could only say and do. It was a hidden earpiece. Okay. I could only say and do what I was told. Okay. So basically, like I had to do like a secret challenge, and if I passed, we won a big. Uh, I got to the final, and I won a big party. And see if I lost, I was up for eviction compulsory every single week. What? And if, thankfully I passed. And then I went on to, to win the show. That's amazing. But it was a huge vote of confidence in me and who I was, because I felt inferior and mm. not good enough compared to everybody else. Um, as well as the fun of it being yeah. Big Brother, like, I had an amazing time, met mental people and awesomeness, like chilling with James Corden and like yeah. D Dermot O'Leary and stuff. Um, there was a big personal thing, like I was obviously hiding a lot and dealing with more issues. But it was a big vote for the mm. things I believed in. But then you came out, right? And it must have been mad. Oh my God, right. So I come out Big Brother House. Roly poly Scottish John. That was a quote I think in the Daily Mail. And um it was meant everybody knew who I was. Like and there was people running up to us in restaurants for photos and queuing up and like That's brilliant. um I was like getting harangued on Covent Garden and um I had like all this money, which I won't say, in my bank account just turn up overnight. Like prize money. That's um, incredible. Ta tax free, it's great. Um like overnight yeah. and then like people were interviewing me and I did like the next day I did like a live feed like <laughs> Only me, like Big Brother winner, the next day I'm doing a live interview for yeah. ITV News outside Parliament. That's so crazy. Like Big Brother winner discussing politics outside Parliament. Yeah. I went on Newsnight, I did Question Time, like um, GMTV, like um, I had a momentum and I wanted to talk about the issues I was passionate about, mm -hmm. close the gap between young people and democracy. Yeah. That's what I was dead passionate about. But like, um, I made some pals in there um, and like we went out the next day and like, 
um, me and a, a boxer, a famous boxer, Olympic medalist and stuff, Commonwealth um, medalist, um, Anthony Ogogo, I went out and we, and, and we bought watches, well I bought us all a watch, which was a diamond encrusted fossil watch. That was your first like, w what? winner's money to spend? I uh, treated myself to a big watch mate, bling. For the ghetto eh, got to get my bling in. <laughs> so yeah, I did that on Oxford Street and then we tried to buy a suit. I was like 24 and a half stone, like that's pushing 150 kilograms. Big lad. To try and get a suit that wrapped around me for the rat party and stuff was crazy. So we had a couple of days having an amazing time um, in London. Then they have a big rat party where everyone comes together and just has a great time. I don't know really do nightclubs or didn't then. So that was a bit surreal and it was good fun. And then the flying, the flight to Scotland, there was all these people with banners cheering me when I got to Edinburgh Airport. I had a camera crew filming like the winner story. And then we had a big party in a big like local bar where, where I come from. All the taxi drivers gave us free rides because it was John from Big Brother. And we just like had a great big time. It was Amazing. phenomenal. And it gave me a platform to talk about the stuff I cared about. Okay. So I mean, that was amazing. So I was cool yeah. for the first time in my entire life. Um, so I was booked to go and speak in big conferences, to go and speak at yep. schools, and, and it started to channel my energy into doing good with the platform yep. I had. I didn't want to be some like <clears throat> fame hungry, kind of do it for the sake of it person. Okay. I wanted to use my platform with a purpose. So stop me if I'm going too far ahead, right? But stop. Now, nowadays, <laughs> nowadays you're like the, the chief exec of Dare Lead, you've got the t-shirt on. Um, you run a char charitable organisation, um, Scan Academy. So how did you go from that to Dare Lead? Good question. I suppose now I'm not, I didn't say, I'm, if people say, oh, what do you do for a job? I say, I don't do anything for a job. Um, I, it's not a job, it's a passion. It's a life purpose to close the gap between the haves and the have nots. Mm. To close the gap of the confident and the insecure, of the bullied and the, and the bullies, of the rich, and the and the poor of mm -hmm. the powerful and the and the and the kind of governed. I, I genuinely believe that we can have a revolution in, in yeah. mindset and confidence. So I started to find my own voice mm -hmm. through a mixture of public validation through something like that, exposure, get being given a platform and the things I cared about. I suppose it was natural in many ways. All the things that made me insecure became my strengths. Yeah. Like everything I hated myself for, being the fat guy, being the ginger guy, being the poor kid, being the bullied kid, being the mentally unwell kid. It's now, there's so much power and strength and vulnerability. Yeah. And the things that have always been, it's mindset. Yeah. Until I started to see everything I was mm -hmm. as an asset, I never realized who I, my potential. Mm. And following running the youth parliament and getting back to work in politics and campaigning and being asked to speak, I became, a, I was speaking at things all the time, so I started to find my voice in storytelling. I started to find my voice in people to people engagement and interviews and speaking and speeches. And I realized, I suppose people started to listen to me. Yeah. So I thought, it's one of the few things I'm good at. I need to use my story to ch help other people, yeah. to convince politicians to give us money, to change policies, to inspire people to change their own lives. And that's what I've been doing every day since. Yeah. And that led you on to founding Dirty Lead, right? I remember you told me a story about being on a plane after coming back from a conference in Australia, was it? I was invited to go to Australia with the Queen. With, with the Queen? And the 53 heads of state from the Commonwealth countries. Yeah. The largest gathering of world leaders on earth outside of the United mm. Nations General Assembly. And John Fay Pilton in Edinburgh <laughs> gets invited along to give an address to the heads of state. Yeah. I sat at a meeting, you would have been Jacob Zuma, <laughs> who's now just gone, but the president of South Africa. Yeah. And next to me was a guy called Goodluck Jonathan. Yeah. His name was Goodluck Jonathan yeah. um, of, uh, of Nigeria. He was the head of state of Nigeria. And then you had kind of William Hague and the prime minister of Australia and her majesty and all these different people. And I gave a speech and it was crazy. And then I come back and it just blew me out of the water and I realized the way we inspire people and support young people, especially in poor people and dis disengaged people or, or those having a tough time, the messenger matters. Yeah. It's not just about saying, oh, do this program, there's great words mm -hmm. or content or go on this website or fill in this form. You need to create emotional, authentic relationships. Yeah. And I realized I could do that because part of me was like half of John was like the salt of the earth, authentic, yeah. grassroots, working class John, who was like tree hugging, mm -hmm. believed in supporting people and was like the guy who just wanted to blend in and help. But the other half of me had an ego, yeah. was confident, 
wanted to be the biggest, best, first, ambitious, let's change the world John, who had the audacity to put himself first and get into a position of power. I wanted to be the spokesperson or the chairman or mm -hmm. whatever. So it was that mixture, right, of confidence and audacity with like values mm. and ethics that created the blend of the company that became Dare to Lead. Yep. So daring, like having a spirit and then leading, yep. putting in place effective actions to make a difference. And we wrote that on the back of a Qantas boarding pass after <laughs> that conference in Australia. Because it changed my life so much. And I thought, what am I doing in some middle management policy job? Like, I need to, yeah. I need to go and like, either succeed or fail trying. So, and that time you were living in London, right? I was living in London. It was the height of the recession. Yep. Mass, mass youth unemployment, huge issues. I didn't have a degree, I didn't have anything to fall back on, no money, my family don't have two pounds to rub together. Literally, if I fail, crumble. But so what? Why would I worry about the fear of failure if there's so much to gain by trying? I mean, that's, in the two words, dare to lead. I mean, that's exactly, three words, sorry. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> two words and a number. Dare to oh, lead. Aye. Um, but that's like exactly what you just said there, that sentence aye. is like, you mm. can sum it up in that. In it's that. ginger. Uh, yeah, that's the whole idea. It's not by, by actually, we tried to call it Dare to Dream, but there were some IP, um, like, copyright issues. It was kind of, everybody was daring to dream. Because if you dare to dream, I'm going off on one now, but th the only thing that will stop you doing anything you want is you. Mm. I'm sorry, in a month of Sundays, no matter how bad your life is, whether you're my friend Frederick in Malawi, who himself was an orphan and now runs an orphanage in the 10th poorest country on the planet, or whether you're my friend Taufik who lost his life fighting for democracy in Libya, or whether you're Connor right now down where I come from, who's struggling in the, in the kind of residential care system and issues with, with, with drugs or whatever. Um, the only thing that's gonna stop them is themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and the only wall you'll never climb is the ones you put up for yourself. Feeling sorry for yourself is not gonna change your life with, with, with respect. Um, we can't sit and expect businesses to give us handouts or companies to give us handouts if we're not willing to help mm. ourselves. And that's one thing I've learned. If you back yourself, other people will start to, to start to back you. Yeah. And good luck and fortune will favor the bold, mm. will favor the hardworking, yeah. will favor the confident. And I meet so many people, not just young people, in my work I train from chief executives down to, poli <laughs> down to politicians, down to politicians and young people and, and everyone in between, youth workers. Yeah. Um, we all have an issue with confidence, we all have that imposter syndrome, who am I to be successful? And we look at others nailing it and we think, that, oh my God, they're amazing. Yeah. But if you speak to any successful person, they will tell you it's, it's as mm -hmm. much about attitude and mindset as it is about yeah. talent. Actually, talent, I think it's a bit bogus because the people who dare to get out there and make it happen are the ones that realize it. Yeah. It's nothing to do um, There's a lot of talented talent. people that have never been able to project themselves. Like, like talent can shine, but yeah. you know what? I see a lot of untalented people be very, very successful. Yeah. A lot of average people rule the world thanks to ingrained privilege, systemic privilege, or personal audacity. Or people who've just thought, you know, bugger it, let's go out and get it. Absolutely. Um, I think I'd probably be in that category. Like I've always believed that it is about just getting out there and asking questions, making contacts, doing the right thing, and being brave and being bold, as you say. So you did all these amazing things. You you were on Big Brother and won it, which is amazing. You are you're now a leader of a company. You speak to all these amazing people around the world. But there was actually an event before any of that that I remember you told me changed your life at the time. When you were younger, you went to Africa because so, you've had lots of transformative moments in your life, and I think that's why the story is so inspiring. That each one of these stories is so humongous that they need to be told. Yeah, there's been certain, certain really important and pivotal people who have changed my life, Sean. Um, the first one I talk about um, stumbling across later in life. A diary extract of a guy who lived in the same street as me growing up, one of the few friends I had. And I, and I read it and I've shared it with certain people. But it says things like, I really hate my wife, I wish I was dead. This community and country is horrible with the drugs and the crime and the police. And talks about a teenager being stabbed in his street and how he never sees his dad. And he goes to, and I quote this, when I go to sleep, I hope I don't ever have to wake up. Mm. Nothing will ever change. What is it to look forward to? And I remember reading that and seeing that and thinking, why is this okay? Yeah. Why are kids 
in the capital of our country, in wealthy Britain, giving up for no other reason than a postcode of their birth. And that inspired me to want to change my life and to, to get out there and do something. And that's when I found community activism and that's when I started to challenge politicians and ask why to mm -hmm. things. Why does my life expectancy change by 20 years depending on my postcode in the one city? Why is it that we are effing and blinding and swearing and we're not engaging in you know, uptown and city centre activities? Why are we not being supported to go to better schools or getting great jobs or running businesses? Mm -hmm. Social disadvantage, social inequality, poverty was the answer. So that gave me my fire in my belly, a passion, a purpose, a focus. I didn't have a focus until that point. And so many people who grow up without a purpose or a, a direction, and luckily, well not luckily, but the inequality that I experienced firsthand gave me a passion. It wasn't a distant thing yeah. for me, it was real life. And I ended up getting involved in the youth parliament, as I was saying, which led to me going on a... And then my first ever meeting at the youth parliament, quick story, right? I rock up to Glasgow. They asked me to go along and I'm like, no pal, I'm not a youth parliament type of kid, what are you talking about? So off I go to Glasgow. Now I thought going on a bus, five bus stops, 20 minutes, to Princess Street Gardens, the main city centre of Edinburgh, was like going to like Costa Rica or something. <laughs> I thought you'd get that one trip up the toon <laughs> every year with, with my mum when she managed to get herself up toon over the school summer holidays. Yeah. And we would run riot. All the other kind of kids would be, come away from them children. Yeah. <laughs> I remember like, those days. Well. About, like, you know how it 50 was. 50p buses. Oh, we were, uh, 50p bus, but we thought we were going on holiday. Yeah. We were just going up, up the town to a park for like four hours, five hours, but oh, we made it count. So when I was asked to go to Glasgow and get a minibus and drive on the motorway, this was a massive deal for me. So we arrive in Glasgow and I'm like still dealing with this huge chip on my shoulder where I'm from, kind of insecure, but I'm passionate. It's like my passion is overriding my insecurity and my fear of not fitting in and my imposter syndrome. And it was the SYP Agam. Mm. And what's an Agam? <laughs> AGM, the annual AGM. general meeting, right? <laughs> we were at the Royal Concert Hall with matching curtains and posh carpets with no holes in them. And I was like, oh God, look at this, posh. <laughs> um, and they're having elections. And I'm reading it, there's two people going for chair, two people going for secretary, two people going for treasurer. But there's only one person running for vice chair. I said, why is there only one guy going for vice chair? And people went, oh, oh that's, that's Christopher. That's our friend Christopher, it's his turn. And something just triggered him. He went, well, what are you talking about? Can I run? Like, we need to have a competition. Yeah. Down the right, John Lighton. People went, who's this John character <laughs> running first meeting? Chair, vice chair of this national organization. And they're all in nice fancy uh, blazers and they've got their kind of hipster haircuts and their, their show off designer beards and what were you thinking wearing? they're cool. Eh? What were you wearing? So I was, right, neck to ankle in a Deodora baby you are blue not. tracksuit. You were not. Popper trousers. Remember poppers? <laughs> <Could you laughs> I remember, remember poppers. poppers. With my uh, Rockport boots and my do you smell what the rock is cooking hat on. <laughs> I took that off though. And then uh, Chris made an amazing speech and a great, a great guy actually. Round of applause, came up, you know, nice and smooth and great. I was kind of awkward, get up, I'm like, boom, 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 I'm like, on the camera, microphone, can you hear me? Everyone can hear me. Um, vote for me, because it's a middle class debate in society, we need to start again and scrap everything. Obviously I lost that election. But that hit me really hard, I went depressed. Like, you get a wee bit of confidence, and you give something a try, and then it goes bad, yeah. and you go worse than when you started. Mm -hmm. It's like I tried and I failed. What have I learned from that? Who would we all be? if we defined ourselves by our first failures. Yeah. What if Oprah Winfrey gave up after she got sat from the first TV channel? Yeah. Or Steve Jobs gave up after the first time they got sat from his own company? Or Thomas Edison didn't try the light bulb again mm. after 3,000 odd times? It's true. Who would you be if after your first failure? So I think I went to bounce back and the youth parliament gave me the chance to go to Africa, to Malawi on a trip. And it's the second person who changed my life. And when I was there, I went with a chip on my shoulder thinking, how bad I had it, I was mm. on kind of mental health tablets, a social worker, family support, all this stuff, dealing with more issues. And I turned up in the 10th poorest country in the world at the time, thinking I'm going to help these kids. I tell you, cultural engagement is the most enriching experience you could ever wish to have, going out and being a minority somewhere. Yeah. And, and actually, given the background you told us about as well, like you were such a fish out of water. 100%. And you were probably somebody who thought, well, I know because I was in the same position, roughly, 
When you went there, you must have thought of yourself as somebody who had it hard in life. Yeah. Hard done to, had a chip on my shoulder about it, completely. Um, but not really, like, I didn't go around feeling sorry for myself. Mm. I was just very aware of the challenges, like. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I was just in a bad place emotionally. I wasn't stable. Yeah. It wasn't that I felt sorry for myself. I was just not mm. an emotionally strong person. I didn't realise that I had agency. I didn't realise that I could run things. Like, I was just in a fragile place. And I suppose going out to a very fragile country, mm. um, actually became the most strengthening thing I could ever wish for. And I met a young guy called Frederick. And we're sitting at a table a bit like this. And as if he was telling me what he had for his breakfast or what time it was, he dropped into conversation that his parents were dead mm. because of HIV AIDS and malaria, like millions of kids deal with. And that he lived under the bridge and he was one of these street kids and he didn't go to school and he had no family. And the fact he spoke about it like it was normal is what killed me. Mm. And it really got me here because I was a representation of him in a different level and back home and realising that we're not the kind of people who are meant to be successful. And he had a dream to run an orphanage, Sean. I was like, oh, that's sweet, mate, but come on. He didn't have a job centre network. There was no job seekers allowance. There was yeah. no education programmes. There was no social entrepreneur startup funds. There was no access to YouTube channels. There was no way to make your way up like you can now and in this country. And then he went on to say the most powerful thing. He says, I'm now running that orphanage. I'm like, what? And I thought I was radical and open-minded. But I was like, how did you get the funding? How mm -hmm. did you get the insurance policy? Who supported you? He's like, brother. He said, the answer's simple. And this quote changed me. He says, the world thinks in black and white. I've decided to dream in full color. I love that. And so see when he's sitting in front of you and his eyes are big and white yep. and bright and he's leaning forward and it's true. You cannot challenge that. He had every reason to hate God, to question fate, yep. to let society's economic probability happen. Yeah. He wasn't supposed to win. He's not supposed to help. He's supposed to be beaten and crumble over and be another statistic as an African kid and some feel-good charity advert. Yeah. No, he wasn't having it. And he made his mindset override his life circumstance. Mm. And he wasn't going to be the self-narrative of pity. He wanted to change it for other people. Yeah. That had to be my mantra. I couldn't be the bullied fat kid anymore. I couldn't yeah. be the, the impoverished kid. I couldn't be the, the kid who couldn't mm -hmm. have an attention span or who, who didn't see dad or who was surrounded by drugs. I had to be more than the context of my present day. Yeah. And for me, leadership, right, is living every day in darkness, but you still search for the light. Mm -hmm. That is hope. Yeah. And that's why people who come from struggle are the strongest people mm -hmm. so often. That is why there's a story to tell amongst the most successful. Yeah. You know, whether it's cliches to an extent like Oprah or, or, or Mandela to the small examples of heroes every day that we'll never know. Yeah. Um, how you turn your struggle into a learning point mm -hmm. can define you as a leader. And that's what I try my best to do, to inspire other people from every background to realize we're in control of our mindset like Frederick. And if he did it, what excuse do we have? What excuse do we have? It's a really powerful story. I mean, it's one of those that, it's almost like you were meant to meet, meet that person. I mean, I don't really know if I believe in fate or anything, but like. No, I don't. I think you meet your own fate, but it was something I didn't tell you. Um, the kid in the diary was me. All right. <laughs> yeah. And the difference between trying to commit suicide and having my door kicked in and saving my life, having written that diary, having had enough, I was so broken in there, yep. so broken with the chaos of my life. And sitting here now, having the cheek and the audacity to speak to you about my journey. Yeah. It's completely mindset. Mm -hmm. It's completely mindset. I've started to control my narrative. I am not going to allow other people to control my happiness, control yep. my worth. I'm not going to let my the poverty of my background define the levels mm. of my future because my postcode is not my destiny. Yeah. And it doesn't have to be yours or anybody else's either. We can all redefine our lives. We are all the core agents of yeah. who we want to be. Mm -hmm. But it's the ability to break out of it. And it sounds cheesy. I know it sounds cheesy, but gosh, it's true. Well, I think like these stories that you've been telling for years now on stages in front of hundreds of people, thousands of people, millions of people, you said. I, I, over a million people. I've spoken face to face to more than one million people in over 40 countries. And I've raised more than 
six million pounds for charities. I mean, that's incredible. That is such a crazy journey that it needs to be told. I genuinely believe, and I've said this a lot of times before, I'm a vlogger, so I have to believe in this. I do believe in it, that there is such an opportunity to hear your message around the world to a lot more people, because a million people, it's a lot, it's incredible, but there's a lot more people out there who are- I've done it grassroots, face-to-face, -face, yeah. street by street, charity by charity, political party by political party, parliament by parliament. I've run in three different parliaments. Mm -hmm or three different areas, like I've stood for election in the Scottish Parliament, UK Parliament, local council, I've run community campaigns, we've given away lots of money, we've raised lots of money. Um, I think I've been to over 70 countries now. Yeah. And my family, between them, I've never been to any, or, or hadn't been. Um, like, everything I did was new, it was groundbreaking. Yeah. I wasn't supposed to do it, but the, um, the depth of my dreams to help other people was much louder than the naysayers and the haters and I got bullied and people mocked me and said I'd never achieve anything and well, who's laughing now? Exactly. Um, who's laughing now? I mean, that's a good motivation for me as well because I had a lot of similar experiences to you when I was younger and yeah. part of my motivation has been I want to prove them wrong. You know? what, what do you think, like, what's your main motivation behind the videos you put out now and the platform you're building? Like, do you think there's a, do you find yourself connecting with people on a deep level? Absolutely, I mean, for me it's about spreading a message. And the way to do that now, efficiently, to so many people, and to an amazing global community is online. And that is why I think, I've been trying to encourage you to do these videos. And I think we should do, like, a series, maybe a month long, four or five videos, because there's a lot of stories in between the stories that you just told. Like, the daily stuff that you get on with, where you've come from, the companies you run now and maybe we can turn this into a four or five part series of videos about John. I have an issue sometimes with influencers. Yeah. And content creators. It's a horrible word. And YouTubers and online celebrities or Insta-famers. Which you are now becoming part of. Just. <laughs> <laughs> I am. I agree, but no, but... Though... I was saying... But those of them mm. who see the fame or the coverage, or the likes, as the whole point, for me is a bit futile. It's a bit like, you're only making a, a, a TV show to get good ratings. Yeah. You're only wasting, like, what, what's the purpose? Mm. I don't see. So I'm interested in working with people who are building platforms with a purpose. Yeah. So that's what I'm quite interested in. I think YouTube, I think social media, I think Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, whatever platform you're on, most of us are on all of them in some form or certainly consume them every yeah. day. Mm -hmm. It is the new normal. Yep. It's not new now, it's the new normal. And we need to look at how do we get on board with it? Well, I think if it you can look, change the world. It's changing, it's the, world. changing it's the, world. the world. And I think as well, if you look in terms of a platform of influence, if you look even like, we were talking about Big Brother there, there are bad actors on Big Brother and there are good actors. The people who want to spread a good message on Big Brother and people who spread bad messages. We've seen it before. We saw a lot of people who were like, deplorable on Big Brother. They, we wanted kept, they got voted out, most of them. But I think one of the reasons, of many reasons you won is because you, you had an honest message um, and you were being truthful. And I think social media is exactly the same now. It's just another platform. It's the modern, the modern platform. It's a modern Big Brother. And it is one platform. Like, I genuinely think there's no substitute for face-to-face -face engagement. And I Absolutely. think we do that so much. But <clears throat> if I can help inspire one person or engage in one mind, like whoever, this person is watching this video, you will have a struggle, you will have a story. There's no uniqueness in what I'm talking about. It's really important, like, I mean that. It's mindset. And if we choose to rethink things, it's always a choice. And don't aim to be happy. Mm. That's, a, aim to be useful. Mm. Aim to be fulfilled. I like that. Aim to help others. Aim to be productive, not just busy. Aim to be loved and be mm. loved, not to be liked and admired. Aim to, don't just make, there's a phrase that, that says, be better than the person next to you, if you want to make it. How do you say, how do I make the person next to me better? Mm -hmm. And I think like there's a lot to be said about inner peace and love and live your values yeah. and chase a purpose. Because like happiness, like you said, is a, is a arbitrary term. Because even you and I, we have moments of happiness and moments of sadness every single day in our lives. Come and go, it will come and go. I have sad days all the time. So, like that, that is a that is a difficult and probably futile thing to chase. But it's perspective. Mm. One person's, it's, it's, for me happiness is life expectation mm -hmm. plus life 
equals your level of contentment, which mm. we call happiness. Yeah. And so many people, I see it, so many people crave girlfriends or boyfriends to attach to, to feel valued or valid or loved. And then they go through a breakup and they have a massive meltdown and they've lost themselves. Yeah. Because they put all their happiness in someone else. Or they completely focus on their job that they don't ever live. And I work with people now who say, mm. oh, but my dream is to go to California or you're gonna run a yoga retreat or start up an animal charity or, but the dream never happens. They're caught in this colluded 95 of economic slavery and making somebody else's dream happen. Yep. Bite the bullet, I quit a well-paying job overnight to go and set up Dare to Lead. It was a minus a grand of overdraft, but I thought, sod it. Yeah. Why? Well, I need to go and try. Mm -hmm. And that's what dating's about. Taking a risk, even when it's not obvious. But there's a big reward at stake. Absolutely. Yeah. So Dare to Lead, and now it's Dare to Vlog. 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 Is this a vlog? I think so. What does vlog stand for? Video blog. And now you are a video blogger. Be also, you like you do Instagram, you do Twitter, you do Facebook. People should check you out on all the platforms. At? At John Lytton. I forgot my name. <laughs> <laughs> what did I do? <laughs> By the way, like, I this was quite a serious interview. What? Heavy. Like, you're not usually this serious. I'm, I'm always this heavy, though. Yeah. You know what I'm <laughs> so. Like, we've had a lot of laughs, so throughout this series of content, you're going to see funny stuff, you're going to see serious stuff, important stuff. Hi. No, it's really important, so I want to just talk to you guys. I want to start a conversation. I'm really intrigued, and I could do with some inspiration online from you guys as well, so it'd be good to start to build an engagement, learn what works, learn what doesn't. That is the end of this interview. Done. On your own channel. I've been interviewing John in his own channel. This is my channel. Lane. This is your channel, so you should sign it off. Welcome to my channel. How does that... So, this is my first ever video sign off. We've right. done a few vlogs on your channel. You've done a few videos, right? I know, but I was trying to sound momentous. Right. Right, there's some there. Watch the old ones. They're okay. pretty cringe. You'll see very. But also, the series from America is on my channel as well. Yes. You'll get to see John at his like, very humorous best. Oh. John should be a stand up. And you can check you can check Sean's vlog by clicking here. Yeah. It will actually be up here. But. So, guys, if you've survived this far, I am proud of you. You're already ahead of the game. <laughs> <laughs> um, this is the first ever episode of Loutin' About. Keep living your truth, keep loving others, keep daring to lead, and we'll see you again soon.